Hi, this is Hafada and welcome to Final 50, where I travel to the last 50 countries on earth. And today we are covering a behind the scenes of my trip to Mongolia so that you can avoid those common mistakes and save you time, especially if your time is limited and you're on a budget. So let's get started. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of a background. Mongolia is said to be in the center of the world and sandwiched between two great superpowers, Russia to the north, China to the south. Now, what's crazy is that Mongolia is in the top 20 largest countries in the world, yet the population is only about three and a half million people, making it the least densely populated country in the world. Okay, it's time for two facts and a fiction. The dish we fondly love, Mongolian beef, is the national dish of Mongolia. There are more horses than humans in Mongolia. Mongolians play a game called shege, which involves the ankle bones of sheep and goats that are used often as dice. So which one of those is the fiction? Wait till the end and we'll tell you the answer. Now, here's the overall goals of the trip from a macro perspective. Now, I really want to go to Mongolia because as a history buff, I heard so much about the history and the culture of the country that stretched over a thousand plus years. So that was really one of the first things that really kind of excited me about Mongolia. But what really also started to excite me as I started planning the trip was the wildlife, the nature, the food, the culture. There was so much in there that as I was trying to unpack the trip and how I was gonna do it, I started learning about and really got me excited about the trip. So make sure to check out the vlog that we are going to kind of uh, put at the end of this video so that you can check out exactly what I did on the journey from a kind of like, again, from a macro and micro uh, perspective, kind of like a story for you. So let me tell you a little bit about the path of the journey. I was doing some work in Dubai and flew from Dubai to Istanbul, then Istanbul straight to Ulaanbaatar. Once I got there, uh, what we decided to do is go straight to the Gobi Desert, to the steppes, uh, and explore that, then drive back to the capital of Ulaanbaatar, uh, and then use that as a base to kind of go and see different things in the surrounding national parks and regions and so forth. I only had four days on the ground, so I really had to maximize my time if I wanted to see everything or as much as I could and prioritize as much as I could in terms of the goals of the trip, again, in terms of wildlife, history, nature, culture, food, music, and so forth. Uh, so I packed a lot in there, but I was able to, I think, really pull it off and get a good sense of what the country had to offer. Okay, so let's get into the logistics. Now, in terms of flights, as I said, I flew from Dubai to Istanbul and Istanbul to Ulaanbaatar. Now the issue here is that there's not many direct flights to Ulaanbaatar, especially from the US or Europe. So what you've got to do is there's, I think South Korea has a direct flight into Ulaanbaatar. I think China does, Istanbul does, and maybe there's like two or three other destinations. So you've got to be really smart. I love going through Istanbul because I love the airport. I love the country. I love the city. And I love the Turkish Airlines, which has just been a very reliable airline that's connected me to a lot of places. In terms of accommodations, when we decided to go to the Gobi Desert, we were trying to find gears, which are otherwise known as yurts, right? Gears in Mongolian. These are like the huts, that, the kind of tense huts that they, that they uh, many of the nomadic people live in, and uh, even regular folks in Mongolia stay there. And so we wanted to kind of check that out. And when we got there, it was really, really hard to find one. We just kept going from camp to camp to camp. And then thankfully we landed on one that was really in a great location next to one of the places we really want to go to, which is a place called the White Stupa, which is kind of like kind of on the cusp between the Gobi Steppes and the Gobi Desert. A really, really cool, beautiful, beautiful landmark. Thereafter, when we got to, uh, back to Ulaanbaatar, I was able through a friend of mine to get an Airbnb right smack in the middle of the city, which was awesome because I walked everywhere, right there in the center of Ulaanbaatar, I even ran around there. So that was definitely where I stayed and it was comfortable, it was safe, it was clean. There's just so many buildings popping up there because of the boom that's happening in Ulaanbaatar and Mongolia from minerals like coal and so forth because there's a huge untapped reserve of coal in the country. And China is definitely working to kind of tap into that and therefore investing heavily into Mongolia. Mongolia. In terms of costs, I felt that the costs in Mongolia were relatively affordable, but obviously if you want to go to ritzy restaurants and ritzy hotels, it's going to cost you. It's probably going to be on par with hotels in Europe and the West. But if you want to just kind of eat locally and do things locally, it's quite affordable. I went in the off season, I think during the main season, which I want to say is over the summer, it would probably get more expensive, especially there's so many cool festivals in Mongolia that you'd want to tap into that 
essentially the prices of tourism does go up. So just be mindful of that. I wanna kind of talk about safety. I felt very safe. As I said, I walked all around Ulaanbaatar. I ran around Ulaanbaatar and I felt very safe there. I don't think there's anything to really kind of worry about, but always, always check your country's listing on the your, your Ministry of Foreign Affairs or State Department or whatever to see if there's any major issues that are popping up. But from what I'm seeing, Mongolia is fairly stable and it's fairly safe. And lastly, transportation. I was really lucky. I had a friend of mine there, Mag who was super awesome. He's the one who scooped me up from the airport in uh, Ulaanbaatar. He's the one who drove me into the Gobi Steps. We hung out there, then we drove back. We went to the National Park. He was a big, big help in terms of seeing a lot of the country. What he also did is he set me up with a local taxi driver who was able to kind of take me to another national park and see like the, the wild horses uh, and so forth that I'll talk about. Now, what's funny is in Ulaanbaatar, there's very limited, if almost no taxis. Now they have an app, kind of like an Uber app, but you have to have a local number to get it. So it's just too much of a pain if I'm only there for a couple of days. So what you do is literally just hail a cab in the street, like not hail a cab, hail a, a car, and, and just stick your hand out and somebody's gonna stop by and they are typically drivers and you negotiate the price and then you, you go to your destination. Obviously, if you don't speak the language and a lot of people don't speak English, it makes it difficult. So I had my local friend kind of send me the address in, in the local dialect and the price of how much I should pay from one destination to the next, which really was helpful. But it's a funny quirk in Ulaanbaatar that there isn't taxi so readily available. Okay, it's time for the five don'ts of Mongolia. If you see a wild camel, those double hump camels out there in the middle of nowhere in the Gobi steppes in the desert and so forth, admire them, like them, but don't ride them because it could be very dangerous. Don't stand in the doorways of gears, the huts, because if you stand in the doorway, it's seen as poor manners. On the top of hillsides, they have these rocks. Don't pick, I mean, what you're meant to do is take three rocks and you circle the uvo and drop the rocks in there as you circle it. And it really kind of is a blessing to the spirits and it's a sign of good luck and so forth. So you don't want to pick up the rocks or do anything from the uvo because it's sacrosanct. Do not accept a gift with one hand or anything with one hand. Always accept it with two hands or put Put your, your left hand under your right elbow and accept and accept it with your right hand. Don't get close to the Perlansky horses. These are the wild horses of Mongolia. They're not used to seeing humans being around humans and the park rangers are very, very protective of them. So admire them from a distance. Now, what I like to do is to kind of give you the top highlight, the top level moments that really kind of the, the highlights of the trip uh, with a final the moment that I really kind of want to bring uh, to your attention. So here are some of the highlights of the trip. Um, when I was out there in the Gobi Steppe, it was unbelievably clear. There's no light out there. So you see stars and Milky Ways and it's just so magical to be out there and, and to see that. So definitely stargazing was one of the highlights out in the, in the Gobi Desert. Waking up at sunrise and going to the White Stupa was just beautiful. The White Stupa kind of reminded me of like Colorado, the kind of, those kind of canyons and so forth. It was a beautiful one. It kind of oversees the whole steps. We went there during the day. It was a little crowded. So we went back for sunrise and it's just magical. You can hear a pin drop from like hundreds of miles. It was just absolutely gorgeous. Walking through Terlij National Park was just amazing because what this place is, is where Mongolians from Ulaanbaatar, they kind of go there on the weekends and during holidays. And it's like a canyon, a national park that's just untouched, gorgeous, rocky trees, like rolling green hills, really, really magical. For whatever reason, I felt like this aura there, absolutely gorgeous. So if you have a chance in your own Baltar, make sure to go to that national park and check it out and just hike and eat and just kind of relax out there. Oddly enough, I'm not big on these kind of like cultural centers or cultural villages, but we went to one called the Nomadic Mongolian or Mongolia. And it was amazing. Like they showed us throat singing, how they brew their local fermented cow milk into like an alcohol. They, we rode like cattle and different animals, horses and cows and stuff like that. Just absolutely awesome to kind of see them. And then they showed us a demonstration of how they actually pack up their whole little village with the yurts and stuff and then go off and you know as nomads because what's crazy about Mongolia is that 30% of the country is still semi-nomadic and so they showed us of how they kind of easily assemble and then follow each other out into the next location that they would as as nomads so that was really a, a cool experience one I definitely recommend and it's not far from Ulaanbaatar the other highlights was god there's so many but this one I really loved again it's something like one of those 
cultural shows, but man, they, they pulled out the stops. It's right there in Ulaanbaatar. They show you all the different music over the ages in all the different areas of Mongolia, all the different traditions, the different instruments, mechanisms of singing, uh, men, women. They had acrobatic demonstrations, just really awesome. So if you're in the capital, go and check out the culture show. It is so, so worth it. The music alone is just fascinating. Now, I have to say, what was the moment? Typically, the moment for me is always one of happiness. Uh, I have to say this moment was just heart-wrenching and a reminder of the fragility of life. It gets me emotional even thinking about it. And it's crazy because you wouldn't think that what I'm about to tell you. But while we were walking through the, the Gobi steps, we came across a camel in the distance kind of sitting on its own. And we're just like, that's kind of weird. It, there was no other camels within like miles. It was on its own. And as we got closer to it, we could kind of smell a little bit of a putrid smell of like rotting. And as I got close, I noticed that its foot was mangled and it was bleeding and so forth. They had tied two flags on it, a red one and a blue one. Whoever owned the camel, I guess just left it there, uh, hoping that it would heal and then give it this, these flags to kind of let it heal, you know, because it's a sign of good luck. But it was so, so sad just to see this camel. You know, I came up to it, I tried to feed it and it was obviously scared and so forth. But it was just a heart-wrenching moment because I'm like, this camel probably is not gonna make it through the winter. My friend Maga was telling me because its, its humps were kind of flat because there wasn't enough fat in there that would have been stored for the winter that was coming up. And it just would be enough. It was just a sad moment, but one that just really highlighted the fragility and the raw and authentic nature of Mongolia. Well, I hope you enjoyed this behind the scenes of Mongolia and gave you a lot of information for you to think about and digest in terms of planning your own trip to the beautiful country of the eternal blue skies, they call it. If you have any questions, please post them below. Again, I want to create an exchange, a community with you. So any questions, anything, I would love to answer them. Love to help you out on your journey. And I hope you can help me out on my future journeys as well, including hopefully going back to Mongolia and seeing more of the country. Don't forget, we've got a vlog and a blog. The blog kind of like memorializes everything I just kind of talked about, uh, which is on our website and the vlog, which is kind of like mapping out the journey of what I did over the course of those four days, which you can find, we'll put it up here for you in the end cards. Let's quickly give you the fiction. The fiction is Mongolian beef is a concoction of Chinese cuisine, has nothing to do with Mongolian cuisine. It's just a kind of an artifice that came out of Chinese cuisine. That's why you always find it in Chinese restaurants. Thank you for watching. Stay curious and I look forward to seeing you on my next journey.